It's the most wonderful time of the year. Jill yeah. Sholin is back and she's gonna talk about a movie she's in. It's the most wonderful time of the year. How was that? How was that? Woo woo! Uh, that was woo 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 woo. <laughs> Jill liked it. That's all that matters. <laughs> It doesn't matter if I don't like it. Look, you guys have already won because you're both incredibly festive. And here we are. It is Christmas time. This is uh, we're, we're, this is uh, a, an exclusive uh, special uh, segment for the Geekscape uh, annual holiday fundraiser. Right. Uh, so, Jill, we're so happy to have you back. Uh, we're, we're always happy to have you. We're happy to have you especially back today to talk about... Um, a film that we have not covered with you, which was 1986 is Babes in Toyland. Um, that uh, that you were well a part of, uh, st starring in, and we'd love to hear all about it. Okay, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> and um, yes, and I'm sorry that I'm not best. I'm turning into a little child thinking about Toyland. <laughs> I know when you when you logged on with us and you and I noticed you're wearing that pink sweater. It flashed me back to the opening of the movie when you're wearing that pink raincoat. Yes, yes, I do. This was just arbitrary, and the fact that it has stars totally arbitrary. Well, you're a star, and we're happy to have <laughs> our star back on the show. Wait, you, when you say arbitrary, meaning like there's no, there's no. Uh... It was the only thought was into it. I was like. Ugh. I wish I had slept more this week. I, <laughs> God, God, God. You know, let's take the attention away from the wrinkles in the bags. I'll no, no, <laughs> no, no. You, you look, you look amazing. And so you, you were just saying that there was no seasonal um, Christmassy yes, yes, intent, yes, but, yes. but not I only got pink, but then all of a sudden when, when Zach is doing this with the shirt, I'm like, oh, look at that, stars. Yeah. <laughs> right? Zach has the never-ending story, the Falcor exclusive, an amazing um, print. Is that is that by a an 8-bit artist? Is that an 8-bit? Uh, it, it was some somebody in China probably made it, and it's so hot. It's I know it's wintertime, but um, I'm like roasting in this thing right now. <laughs> it's made out of polyester. It looks cool, but- Child labor, feel. probably. Probably. Yeah. yeah. But who, but the time and effort someone put into this thing is pretty fantastic. But, you know, I, I'm all about festive times and, uh, and it is and great because it has this sense of like waking up on Christmas morning in your pajamas, like on the top half. Yeah. It, and then, it does. And it, then you, know, you realize I'm wearing and, skinny jeans on the bottom half. So. Um, <laughs> well, right. But no. no, but I mean, but then there's just so much going on, uh, never ending story wise, which is great. It's a never ending sweater. People it, could just yes. look and gaze. <laughs> yes. And not enough. Um, uh, and never then, ending cool. There you go. And then Jill, I, for you. <laughs> right. I take it. Exactly. Jill, I just wanted to comment. I, I think that the rich girl poster looks amazing behind you. You know, the fact that it matches the sweater is a bonus. But yes. Um, <laughs> but but I, think, I share it with you guys. What? Yeah. Well, I think no. you should keep it up. I, I, I just think you should keep it up. Oh, no. I, uh, so for anybody watching, listening to this, I said that my fiance, I came home after I had made a move when I moved in with him and uh, the glass had been broken and he put it up on the wall. He surprised me. I was out of town. I came back. He thought it'd be a wonderful surprise. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so sweet of him. He's just so, you know, so kind and sweet that well, it's, you know, hard to rip it off the wall <laughs> for him. <laughs> did he listen to your interview that you did with us or watch the interview? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. You know, okay. he he's the one that makes me aware of things. You know, he'll say, oh, look at this new thing that came out. Are you? Oh, look at this. And so he's much more aware of, of that type of thing, but he, he, we haven't talked about it. And I'm very sorry. Don't be mad at me for saying that. We've been, it's been very full. Last night, a bear broke into our second home. Oh. <laughs> <Speaking of> Christmas. 
<laughs> so, I, well, first of all, before we talk more about babes, I just want to say, you know, we've had Jill on the show, well, including her appearance on our fundraiser as well. Uh, but oftentimes things happen in your life and scheduling can be tough. And we want to thank you for coming on and making time for us because obviously uh, we love your work. And we're a fan of who you are as a person, not just what you do on screen. And uh, it's an honor to have you back on the show. Um, for those listening and watching, at this point when this airs, uh, something, Jill might be doing another thing with us at in Los Angeles, but we'll talk about that another well, time. Well, that, that'll have already aired. That'll have already okay. happened. So that was so, the greatest thing we ever yes. did with you. So that thing that we did with you <laughs> at LA Comic Con was amazing. Um, yes. But I... so. I was watching Babes in Toyland the other night, and it's got a star-studded cast. Yes, uh, it really does. It was a it was a made-for-TV movie, right? Was that what ideally what was? Yes, I think uh, technically, if you we if anybody cares about technical terms at the I time, I think they do. It was a miniseries because remember, TV movies were so popular then. They, 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 everything was classified. This is a series. There were mini series, not limited series, the way they call them now. Um, and I think anything uh, television wise that was over two hours had to be considered a mini series. So oh, okay. technically, it was a mini series. We it was three hours, yes, which would account for the slowness and <laughs> other things. Well, someone had the wise idea to condense it, cut it down to like 90 minutes, basically, and it release was, it. It was always, it was always, um, I, I apologize for jumping in on that. No, no. Um, it was always, that was the design for America. It was on, a, for the US, it was on television, but for the worldwide market, we always knew from before we shot a day of footage that they would be releasing it as a feature. Okay. And it would be the a more condensed version. But, you know, there were some issues, I think, around that time. I mean, we'll go into it, but, um, but more heavily. But one of the issues at the at the back end, I think, I, I think Orion, I think Orion was behind it. And yeah. they were having some financial issues because they went bankrupt not mm. long after. Because I remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but um, in their bankruptcy, they did some kind of deal or something with McDonald's where they would like buy a <laughs> meal or whatever, and then you can get these videos for only five dollars. Oh, gosh. okay. Zach yeah. probably owns them, and, yeah. and, the, and the, whatever and one, the Happy Meal was, he's got it. <laughs> one right? of them was Babes in Toyland. I mean, it just did crazy. It did crazy numbers being sold through McDonald's. And grocery stores. I remember seeing it at grocery stores. They would have, you know, tapes to buy as you're walking out. Babes in Toyland's right there with yep. you and Keanu and uh, Drew smack dab on the cover. Yeah. Yep. So just <laughs> just some big, big uh, some brief background for those that might not be familiar with Babes in Toyland as a, as a whole, because it was originally conceptualized as an operetta, I think in the late 1800s, very mother goose nursery rhyme, uh, heavy meets, you know, meets musical. And over, you know, more than a decade, it's had so many different uh, visu visualizations, versions. And of course, uh, I believe that yours, the 1986 version is like, I think the most recent, uh, don't quote me on that, but I feel like um, with, with you and Keanu Reeves and Drew Barrymore, uh, that, yeah, that is one of the more, it's it's like every generation, you know, has their own babes in Toyland, essentially. Yeah, and maybe our version made it die on the vine, I don't know. I mean <laughs> <laughs> it caused Orion to go bankrupt, Fuck world. and uh, <laughs> and that was the end of Babes in Toyland. I don't know. Maybe things follow me. I don't know because then I did that other movie a, a couple years, just a few years later. Uh, there goes my baby, and that's really when it went bankrupt. Oh, that, they just assembled that and threw it out. Oh, you know, I, I think it went. They went bankrupt before that film even got a release. I think its release was after the bankruptcy and then they just tried to 
do whatever they could. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I know is that this film has uh, sustained a cult following. It has. Decade. And, and I think the general consensus is with people is it's really cheesy. It's really corny, but it's super nostalgic fun. And I think that's yet another reason why, you know, movies like this stand the test of time because it brings up that nostalgia of an era that when they were kids, you know, so many people watch this when they were kids of the eighties and now they're like, I remember that time so great. And there were a lot of moments in the eighties that were not great, but if you can like encapsulate certain things that, and remind and give you good feels, then that's all that matters to me really. I, th I think so too. I mean, I have that, that um, philosophical argument with a lot of my jazz friends you know, and they, I have to be careful what I say here because I'll give them away who they are. But they're people that have played on pretty much everything, you know, because the great jazz players in LA are also the studio musicians that are right. doing all the soundtracks and um, overall. And, um, but I have this argument with them, especially over one film that went hugely successful with music. I can't say which one it was, but they don't like it. That's why I can't say it. I can't say the name of it because they can't stand the music and they played all the music and yet it, it was a huge hit. And yeah, sometimes uh, La La Land, you know, the land of yeah, La La can yeah. be a little tricky in this world. <clears throat> so, <laughs> they, I, yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. But, you know, they don't like it and, and they say, well, it's not, you know, the music in these particular films are not at a certain level. And, and I say, but it's not about that. No. Really, it's not. It's like, you know, that's, uh, forgive me, audiences, please forgive me. I'm going to say something I shouldn't say. But I think when we approach things from such a point of view as an artist that I'm untouchable, right? If it's not done to reach people and to touch people's hearts and make people feel good, then your experience of an artist of doing it may be a little wankish. Yeah, that's a great way to describe all it. Self, all self-indulgent, my performance, my, they can't understand it. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're flashing me back to this time when I was in a band with a bunch of guys who were really talented and, and everyone brought a song to cover to the table and I would bring certain songs and they were like, oh, I don't want to do that song. And I'm like, it's how you make it. It's what you bring to the table. It's the nostalgia people feel. If it's I'm sorry, they were song, bad songs, Zach. They were really <sighs> bad songs. And it was train that, and we did it. You have to live with that. <laughs> Can't just um, come with any song you want. Be like, this is awesome. It's like, because most people don't feel that way. Speaking of songs, and I'm going to rough segue. Speaking of songs in Babes in Toyland, Leslie Brickhouse does the music for the film. And the minute that popped up, I had forgotten that he did. And when I watched it again, I'm like, that's the that's the nostalgia behind Willy Wonka. Like that is the 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 score for Babes in Toyland, I think is great. And I'm as an as as someone who's on the outside looking in when it comes to writing music, composing music, if you can compose something original, I'm always in awe of that, whether it's considered good or not, you know. Well, you know. I, your, I, our experience of the music may be different, but I'm right on board with you about Leslie Burkus. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to do the film. They were going to let me sing, and I did sing. I sang very poorly in it because the well. day, no, I did. The, and none, none of my singing is in the film, but. I mean, it is, but it isn't. The, the the shortened version, the one that everybody sees on the, the DVD, whatever. The yeah. Cincinnati? Uh, yeah, like that's me. And, and you know, I yeah. sing with you and all that. That's all good. But there was another number that Keanu and I did that is just really bad. And the day I sang it, I couldn't say, I was like, we had traveled right when we came over. Because we flew, first we had to go to England for a couple of days for wardrobe fittings. And then we flew on to Munich, Germany. And the first thing they wanted to do were the pre-records. Okay. Well, I was sick. Mm. I, I had no voice. And they were like, 
Don't worry about it. This is just for the playback. Was oh it just for the playback? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it wasn't. So you, you just sit there and you mock it down. Right. And mm -hmm. you're like, you can't sing. You know, you're struggling to like, well, you know what it's like when you're really hoarse and stuff. And, right. and, and I think sure. that was in the, I don't know if in the back end they just said it's not worth it. They were cutting that song anyway. It was only in the American version on TV for the one night it aired, that Keanu piece with Keanu in the jail. Have you seen it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. 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 It's pretty bad. And <laughs> I'm mortified, you know, as somebody that does sing and writes and, you know, that that's out there in the world. I'm mortified. Yeah, because it's nothing. Out. They did nothing to say, oh, let's redo it. They just like slapped it on out there. And <laughs> so that was kind of shocking. And, and, and you did not know that until you saw it? Uh, You're saying? I thought we'd be redoing it. Right. Yeah. Like waiting for the call. And when at we... that, yes. And at that time in my career, first of all, in that at that time in my life when i finished a movie you move on mentally you right. know i wasn't thinking with the same type of, course. of brain of course that i would now where i would be if i did a movie like that and i did a pre-record i first of all i might ask to do it differently because i like the, the raw sound but like how they shot you know how they did late miz yeah where you know, they shot the performances and um, I love that. There's something about that that's so wonderful. Yeah. And then, then if the voice does something unique, cracks its beat or does something that's off, it's because of what's happening and it's tied. The vocal then is tied to what's going on organically. Right. And so it's a different experience of a performance. And um so anyway, I would just have eyes on that now if, you know, but I'm not doing that kind of thing now. So <laughs> it's easy for me to say, but I was mortified about that, that, that piece. I'm not mortified with the fact that you, uh, that, that, that I want to focus on the Cincinnati song you guys sang. I come from at first they called it Cincy, but since Cincy is so natty, they named it Cincinnati, so they say. Hey, the, the girls, girls are pretty, pretty, pretty in this pretty little city. The fellers are the feistiest I've seen. And when it comes to ball teams, the Reds and the Bengals mall teams. a fun one <laughs> that is that what well, that was not written for this that was like is that cincinnati's home you know how every city or I state has I, so. I think leslie burkis wrote it no that was okay. de definitely written for this okay because i just got it really yeah. quickly foster city where my wife is from they have like a song that they would sing in high school it was like the foster city song so let's say that again can i look it up really quickly elementary school can I up really the quickly? Foster City Elementary School song? Yeah, I mean, schools have songs, Zach, but they don't just include that in like. <laughs> you can't well, just I, include like a song movie in a. I, I felt like in a Christmas was like, movie. Is this song? Was this a song that the Cincinnati school district the kids would sing in elementary school? Or but the, no, the fact that there's so much. Oh, he wrote it. Leslie Burkus wrote it. There's so okay. much oh, Cincinnati cool. okay. pride. You know, you have to love that. Like. You know, you don't see a lot of pride like that, really, in many 
towns, you know, uh, I I mean, certainly cities, no, right? Like, um, there's obviously sports town connections and stuff like that. But for a group of four people in a car, in a Jeep, in a four wheel, in a four wheel drive, driving through a blizzard to just have this moment of like such like, where are we? The best city in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And and break into, (laughs) uh, you know, how to, to, with such earnestness, right? Like we love this. We love this city so, so much. The best city in Ohio. <laughs> I know. But, you know, going back to the whole Leslie Brickers thing and the innocence and the feel good part of it. I mean, we're here to talk about the movie, all yeah. the good stuff and all of that. Just like yeah. all of it. But I'm not sure if they hit the mark in making the movie, in going so much for that innocence. I mean, it was such, it was, I mean, right now, I think, I've been thinking a lot about this because um, of the 80s, and I just got offered uh, another film to do with a a lot of iconic um, 80s people. Amazing. So, but, but Babes in Toyland was more like a throwback to the what 50s 50s or 60s yeah yeah like the um uh, the claymation the claymation specials and stuff like that yeah but done live right exactly and then you know with the little soldiers that were really wooden yeah Mm -hmm. wooden soldiers like really i was there (laughs) they were like little toy wooden soldiers. so cool yeah, it was cool. And and but I I'm, I'm not sure did it translate? Yeah. I mean, again, I have to go back to nostalgically it's fun at this point. You have to look back with a little tongue in cheek sort of thing and be like, yes. "Wink, it's okay. It's cheesy, but it's it's fun and it's a great holiday movie to watch <laughs> with the family." That's a refreshing thing too, you know? I just love your spirit, Zach. <laughs> Yes, I love it. I try to find the joy in everything. Try to. I love that. Yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, I would say (laughs) that like when you look at the the year as a whole, a lot of people on the surface would probably like to get back to Christmas, you know, having that childhood wonder and curiosity and um and I think the reality is, is that like, it's usually very stressful. We have to see family yeah. that we don't like, whatever it is, right? Like, you know, or like, uh, there's just dynamics, there's layers, right? And it's not as simple as, uh, as, as turning on a switch and being like, Christmas, I think right. people try to do that. But on our show, that's what we try and do with that nostalgia aspect. When you, when you watch a movie like Babes in Toyland, and it does take you to that place and you remember like, oh, I was... I was a kid and I, I remember these scenes and I remember the joy that I yeah. felt and the excitement that I can feel about Christmas and the innocence. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, it, it is, it is that easy or it's like they have that one movie, right? We always watch, we always watch this movie. It's, it's, uh, we have traditions um, because I think it's about connecting to those parts of ourselves mm-hmm. um, that we tend to cover up maybe during most right. the rest of the year. Right. And and that's what I think, Zach, the point you were making, right, about, um, you know, that people have a love for a film like this because they have that sentimental sense memory of where they were the first time they saw it. And they're sitting on the floor and the fire's over here and their, yeah. their cousins are visiting. But I will say this, what brings me the most joy about that film, besides some terrific memories, fun memories, um, is in the present moment. And when I say in the present moment, I mean over the years when I've been at a horror convention. And that's where I go, you know, I do so few of them, but to sign autographs in every show, undoubtedly. I get X amount of people that come up and say, do you have anything, babes, in Joyland? And they share with, and they're almost like shaking. Oh, they're oh, joy, yes. babes, in Toyland. And that's the very thing they talk about, their memories. I remember it's a time when people put their best foot forward, many people, yes. because they get into the spirit 
of Christmas and you don't have to be Christian. It's not, no. you know, that for Christians, it has the meaning of the birth of Christ. But I think the, the spirit of all of that, what emanates out of it for people that are non-Christians or non-believers of all sorts, um, it's, it still connects us to something, something greater than ourselves that's very life-affirming. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it, whether it's Christmas or Kwanzaa or, you know, Diwali or, yes. uh, you know, other festivals and celebrations that are, uh, that go on around this time of year, it's what, what matters is, is can you find the joy in that and, and yeah. take yourself out of whatever situation you're in at that time. And hopefully people can, you know, not everybody does. You're right. It, it, this is a really hard time for a lot of people. Um, but you know, that you can either be your character in babes in Toyland, or you could be Richard Mulligan's curmudgeon, uh, toy store, uh, owner who, it's hitting on you twenty four seven, and it's yeah. and and at, at that moment, by the way, that moment in the in the movie, it's in the first like ten minutes or so. I thought, oh, the the eighties when you could be totally creepy on somebody, and there were really no repercussions other than getting a bunch of bouncy balls dropped on top of your head. Even on even on Christmas, uh, my first thought was, I was like, it's cutting class all over again. Like Jill can't <laughs> avoid it. You can't avoid old lecherous. Men like this Roddy is McDowell and this now is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Every no, character in cutting it's class. So funny. I think it's true. I think in um at that time you could get away with things. I'm not because she was young. They played her like right. 18, but right. she came that they come across more like 16, I think. But they I think were, so too. They were 18. Yes. They were, you know, they played. Uh, Jack Nimble as, you know, taking over his father's thing, but they were clearly, clearly very, very young. Yeah. More on the kid's side than the adult side. I mean, she lived at home in the shoe with her mother and little Bo Peep. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The, so, the, the, the quick, the quick synopsis would be that, you, you know, you and Drew Barrymore are sisters. You're her older sister, Mary in, in the real world. Yes. Um, your boyfriend is Keanu Reeves, uh, Jack. And then, you know, Drew has an accident. Her character of Lisa gets knocked out, goes to Toyland, where, of course, everyone in that she knows in the real world is now a, a, a Mother Goose Fable character um, in Toyland. And, uh, you know, she always has everyone's best interest in it, best interest in heart, but she has lost sight of that that connection. That we're kind of talking about here—that connection right. to, being, to a her, child. being a child. <laughs> she, she, for, she was forced to grow up way too fast. Yeah, yeah. forced yeah. to grow up way too fast, or she took that on because it doesn't really seem like anyone in the movie was pushing her to be a grown up. No, no. kind of had that natural, and you know, it's like the mom, the sister. Everyone's like, "Okay, calm down yep. with that." <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it is sweet. I mean, that part of the story, I mean, how true is that for young people? I mean, think about it. That was the in the 80s. Look where it's now. It's like, you know, nine and 10 year olds are trying to be adults. Yeah. 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 Not little 12 year olds. Um, so it's like, you know, that that path keeps getting suspended. So that's a beautiful part of obviously in message of the film is to, you know going back re retaining remembering the child in you i mean it's it's true though you know it could be as simple as like you know an aspiration a buzzword uh, a smell a song i think music does it a lot for me you know music can just bring me back pretty pretty quickly yes and really that's what we're really talking about right the child yeah. is just that that they're so innocent and they're so connected to the other side in the good way you know yeah. like it like i've thought i know i'm going to sound like a total freak of nature right now that i <laughs> think about these things it's like this is what you spend your time thinking about chill <laughs> but i do but i think about you know the way a 
a baby moves, a baby moves like in tandem, right? The legs, arms, it doesn't go, mom, it doesn't do that yet. It takes a eight, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And this is really ego, right? This is, oh, that's my hand. That's my elbow. That's my, that's my foot. This is my leg. But his little babies, the reason I think, these are things, weird things I think about, they move in tandem is they're so connected to oneness. They're so still connected to the other side where ego hasn't infiltrated the system yet. I mean, right. it's part of the human life process, I think, you know, yeah. that that's our challenge in life. Yep. You know, and you need that to, you know, walk around and function on the planet. But I'm, I'm more talking about this, the underlying, the spiritual part, like, how do we do, how do we be connected to ego and disconnected from it at the same time to stay in spirit of beauty and goodness? That's a really good question. And uh, I think one that should definitely be thought about and considered because, you know, there is one side of ego that is not a negative and then there's another side that is. Yeah. And there's a fine line in between there and finding it and connecting with that child, whether you're it's a toddler or whether you're seven at the time, going back to that place yeah. and, and, and finding the simple pleasure, not in, oh, you know, I, I gotta make X amount of dollars to find joy, or I gotta, you know, buy X amount of things to, to find joy. Maybe all you, maybe all we need in life is a little red sled that we fall out of in a Jeep and bang our head on a redwood tree. (laughs) And sing Cincinnati right before it. (laughs) By the way, I was like, in reality, she's probably dead when she fell out of that, when she fell out of that Jeep. Oh, see, he does have some dark qualities. I'm he, just, he just ma- masks them. Um, she didn't have a helmet. She had no helmet on. She had, you know, <laughs> sorry, oh, I don't mean to go there, in, but I, that's the horror side. In of the eighties, kids were much more durable. <laughs> they were. Yeah. This is true. This we, is we, true. we, we, we took some bangs, man. We got hit with stuff. <laughs> I, I really, I, re- I really quickly want to die. Uh, yeah. Go skirt over, the, move over to the fact that you were not only uh, surrounded by, uh, fellow actors at your own age, but you had really solid older actors. Iconic. Brennan, iconic. Mm-hmm. Um, did when you were, and then this is a stage in your career where you had done many projects prior to this and you would go on to do more after. Was this a stage in your career where like, were you still taking mentorship from these other older actors? I don't think so. Okay. I, I felt very, uh, you know, just with them all. You know, with everyone, I mean, you know, ironically, the probably in the main cast, the inexperienced one was Keanu, but I think he was adorable in the film. Oh, well, you're all adorable. Yeah. Drew Barrymore <laughs> delivers lines in it that are just so, if it was by another actor, it might not be the same. It's it's cute, you know, when she says certain things. And on the flip side, you'd be like, that's absurd. <laughs> you know, yeah. when her mother, when... <laughs> Eileen, Bre- Eileen Brennan is, you know, the place, the mom she's calling and she's getting what uh, Dustin, she's like getting her tires changed or something. She's like getting that, her tires changed, changed in the blizzard on Joey. I'm putting chains on Joey. She says, or something. <laughs> that's right. Your little brother. Right? Yeah. And, um, and you know, Drew's delivery of like, yeah, okay, mom or something. I forget exactly what she says, but it's, it's just in the delivery it makes it cute versus like, oh God. Okay, mother, dinner will be ready. It's kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whenever you're whenever you're home. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have Pat Morita as the as the the embodiment of goodness, the toy maker slash Santa. Yeah. Uh, who's trying to see the good in everybody. You know, evil. It, it's not it, it's funny. It's like it nothing's black and white to him. There's no like, you know, he's like, there's good and bad, the battle in everybody. But then by the end, he's like, all right, well, this this guy, Richard Mulligan's character, he's like, he is, he is finally like realizes like he is evil, just totally evil. He lives evil. in a freaking bowling ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, for those who haven't seen it, and I'll just quickly plug the fact that it got released on Blu-ray. Um, and I personally am a huge fan of physical media versus 
doing anything streaming, I think everyone should go out and get Babes in Toyland on Blu-ray. It's just for that nostalgia fun. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. Thank you for that, Zach. Uh, it is. You know, I enjoy, I think I've seen it in the last 10 or 15 years, maybe twice. And and I, I enjoyed it from that from that nostalgic point of view. And of course, all my personal memories, because it was just so fantastic. It was my first time to Europe and, <laughs> and you know, being Amazing. such good friends at the time with Drew and we just had so much fun. I mean, with all those, they had like in the back lot of the studio, I, it was just, they built the whole town. Just like when you go to Universal Studios and they'll show you the street. It was like that, it was two or three s streets. I just, I, I mean, again, and I know we keep coming back to this place about nostalgia being, you know, so saccharine and sweet. And like this movie epitomizes that there, there's, there are some, there are moments in this film where you're like, oh man, what, that was an odd choice to cut where, especially I go, keep going back to the Cincinnati song in the, in the G, the tracker that you guys are in and Drew's face at the whole time is like traumatized, but yet like happy. <laughs> it's a really mm -hmm. weird moment. I know. You know why I think that happened? Yeah, it was like the makeup was bad. It almost looks like she's like has a stomach problem. Like she's kind of looks like she's sweating and it's freezing cold out. I don't know. <laughs> I, the only thing I could think of was, you know, she was really young. I think she was 11 when we did it. And she only got to shoot a couple hours a day. And, um, they were very strict and about the time, her time on set. So they had somebody else. So for almost everything, we were doing the stuff with somebody else. And then she, she would come in, you know, obviously on a master shot, mm -hmm. but then on our shots, a lot of times it, you know, would be the stand in the adult, very small, sweet woman stand in. And, um, so I think that, that, that's how that happened. It almost looks like an insert, like maybe they shot it later. And I, I, I'm not sure, but I've always thought the same thing when I saw it, like, oh, she looks kind of traumatized there because <laughs> she's like, yeah, yeah there. right. You know? Yeah. I'm not sure how that ended up like that. It doesn't seem organic. <laughs> really quick. What, what is, uh, can you name a few fond memories of your of Christmas when you were a child? Like, does anything stand out to you during that time? Well, when I was a kid, I think my favorite, to, I mean, I love Christmas morning with my, my own family, my mom, my dad, and my three brothers. But I think my favorite was Christmas Eve with my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side. I see them so clearly right now. It's so strange. And, um, my cousins, I all, all together, there were 16 of us and that included myself and my three brothers. And wow. we got together for everything. We grew up in North Hollywood and you know, the blocks are well-defined blocks. It's like perfectly a geometrical, you know, yep. thing happening over there, looking down from the sky, you can see it so perfectly. And so we like lived in one house and my one cousins lived only one other house away. There was one house in between us. And then the other family lived, you know how they have the short side of the block and then the long side, the short side over two blocks. So it was like four houses away, you know, but two short blocks. And then their house was the second house. So and, cool. my, and my other cousins lived on the next street over so they were, we were always all together all the time. We all went to the same school, you know, the 16 cousins and, um, and, but Christmas was fantastic. And every year we would pull, you know, names and buy a gift for one of the other cousins, whatever. So that was always so much fun. And, and those were very happy times, never, no fighting, no nothing like that just pure pure joy the way that you imagine 
Well, a- as we start to wrap this up and 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 everybody that's been listening obviously ho- hopefully has the nostalgic feels. Um, are, is there anything that you can talk about that you're working on right now that might be upcoming or is it all kind of under the radar? Can't talk about it yet. Hush, hush. NDA. It is. There are some things still under the radar, but hopefully soon I'm, I'm going to be able to say stuff. You know, you want, you have to be respectful and also you're contractually obligated to, to be respectful, but I would be respectful anyway, you know, without a contract, somebody saying, please don't talk about this. What I can say, which is so exciting for me, but I'm scared too. I must say I'm, I'm frightened because it's, it feels all brand new, even though it's not. And that's that, you know, I have done these couple of films after taking a 29 year break. Amazing. And, Amazing. And I look forward to talking about them. And there are some other things that look like they are um, likely on the brink. And then I told you this other film just popped up and it's uh, and it's really enjoyable. And I love the cast in it. I mean, I love it. But and I can't talk about that either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll definitely I, have you back for that. We, yeah, that'll be the next one. Um, you know, Jill, thank you so much for talking about Babes in Toyland with us and holiday nostalgia. And I mean, it's all the feels. It's it's the good. It's the it's the man. We sh- I wish we could reset this moment, uh, but it's everything. And I, it just brings a lot of joy having you back on the show talking about this. So thank you. But yeah, as always, we love having you on. We love doing things with you. Guys, thank you so much. And thank you for talking about Babes in Toyland. It of um, all the movies that I've done, it has a a very not secret but kind of like secret. It's I let me say it, this treasure part in my heart, and um, I was so excited when I got the offer because of nostalgia. Um, I want I knew it was going to be on every year at Christmas, and I was like, oh. Yep. I've accomplished something really you're, huge. <laughs> you're part of Christmas history. You know, a Christmas Christmas film. Christmas history? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so thank you for bringing this movie and and anyone that watches it, you know, watch it from where Drew Barrymore arrives at, which is with the heart and the eyes of a child. Yes. Yes. Couldn't have yes. said it better. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Have a Mary, beautiful day. Merry, Merry. Merry Festivus. Merry, joyful, Merry, <laughs> Merry, joyful Christmas and every holiday we are celebrating in this season. To everybody. And yeah. Merry Christmas to, yeah, happy holidays to all you Geekscapers. <laughs>